in this seventh session of Look at the Book on on Romans 8, we're going to focus on uh, these two verses right here. And since they begin with 4, let's just glance back and see where Paul is going. What we saw back here in verses 1 to 4 is that what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do, God did. And there were two things. He condemned sin in the flesh, that is, he condemned our sin in Christ's flesh, and thus procured a verdict of not guilty for us because our guilt is put on him, which the law could not do. And as a result of that, in order Something else happened, namely, the righteous requirement of the law is being fulfilled in us. The law, the law back here, could not fulfill the righteous requirement of the law. And so this flesh here is a massive problem. It keeps the, the law from having, having the uh, uh, fulfillment that it ought to have, and it has to be dealt with. So what happens in these next verses is that Paul goes deeper with understanding the nature and reality of who we are in the flesh apart from the Holy Spirit, which shows the desperate need for the cross and the desperate need for the work of the Spirit. So he he begins here with, because or for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. And those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For, he says, for to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the, on the Spirit is life and peace. Those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. There's a a correlation he's drawing out here between a life that accords with the flesh producing a mindset, a mind that is set. That means a mind that uh, prefers and inclines to and enjoys and dwells on and on and on. You could put words in there for the mind that is set, given over to the things of the flesh. And we'll see more clearly as we go along what this is. But the flesh in this text is anything that is minus God, not done in reliance on God, not done in, uh, in pursuit of the glory of God. In fact, here's a helpful uh, parallel. Back in uh, Matthew 16, 23, Peter was resisting Jesus going to the cross, and Jesus turned and said to him, Get behind me, Satan. You're a hindrance to me. Because you are setting your mind, and this is the verb he used right here, you are setting your mind on the things of man, not the things of God, which I think is a really good parallel or paraphrase of the things of the flesh, things of man, and the things of the spirit, things of God. The things of the Spirit are anything in life thought of, conceived of, seen in relation to their origin in God, being sustained by God, existing for the glory of God. They are things of the the Spirit. Things of the flesh are everything minus God. So the mind of the flesh just wants God out of the picture. And so what Paul is doing in verse Five is establishing a a connection between a life that accords with the flesh and a mind that is given over to the things of the flesh and a life that um, accords with the spirit is a produces a mind that is given over to the things of the spirit. Now, why is that the case? Verse four, because to set the mind on the flesh, the mindset of the flesh is death. But to set the mind on the Spirit is 
life and peace. Now, how does that work as an argument for why there is a fixed connection between a life that accords with the flesh and a mind that is set on the flesh, and a life that accords with the Spirit and a a mind that is given over to the things of the Spirit? And it's not an easy argument to construe. I had to ponder several possibilities for the meaning of the word is here. And I'll tell you the one that I think works, and that's how I do this. I try to figure out what uh, makes the argument flow in a way that is consistent. It makes sense. And this is what it seems to me is, is the meaning here. For to set the mind on the flesh uh, is, that is, reveals the presence of the power of death. Yes, it's going to lead to death, but here it's, it's is revealing the presence of the powerful working of deadness to spiritual things, spiritual reality. But the mind that is uh, set on the spirit reveals the presence of a power of life which I think accords with what we saw back here, the law the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. A spirit producing life sets you free from the law of sin and death. And that's what's going on here. That's why the argument works. So let's, let's try to paraphrase the argument with both halves, the, the flesh half and the spirit half. Let's do the flesh half first. A, a life that accords with the flesh inevitably produces a mind that is given over to the things of the flesh because the mind of the flesh reveals the presence of death. And death is making us dead to the beauty and the truth and the reality and the desirability of the things of the Spirit. Therefore, it defaults to the things, the things of the flesh. Or the other half works like this. Those who live according to the flesh, those who have a life that accords with the Spirit, uh, set their minds, are given over to, prefer, incline, enjoy the things of the Spirit because that mindset of the Spirit shows the presence of life and peace. And where life and peace are at work in the power of the Holy Spirit, then we are alive to the things of the Spirit. We're not dead to them. We're alive to them. We can see them and embrace them. So so far, the way this argument is working, we'll, we'll stop here and pick it up next time, is that the, the law was could not could not do the things that need to be done it could not fulfill the law it could not produce love here as the uh, righteous requirement of the law because the flesh is the presence of death at work within us. And that death is making us dead to the beauty of the things of the Spirit, and thus we are left loving and inclining to the things of the flesh.